Welcome to One Arrowhead Drive, everyone, for Chiefs Live, brought to you by your Midwest Ford dealers. Josh with Looney with you here today as we have a free agency approach to today's hour of Chiefs Live. Lots going on in Chiefs Bill here on this Valentine's Day, of course. Hopefully you've got everything picked out for your wife or significant other. I lucked out this year. My wife uh, wants to go to a high school basketball game tonight. She's a high school teacher and they have a big game, so I, I really lucked out. No Valentine's Day dinner. Uh, I, I didn't get a card. I think if I, she just wants to go to a high school basketball game, so I lucked out. Of course, uh, she's a high school teacher, as I said, so at her lunch hour, or right before, I sent Casey Wolf over to uh, embarrass her a little bit, and I just got a text message just as, as we went on this show uh, that had a couple four-letter words and some smiley faces. So uh, I've done my job on Valentine's Day. Hopefully, you have done yours, and Romeo Cronell has done his as he announces the finalization of the Chief 2012 coaching staff. It, it's highlighted by five new hires, one promotion, and 10 staff retentions from the 2011 season. Obviously, the five newcomers, it's highlighted by offensive coordinator Brian Dable and special teams coach Tom McMahon. Those two guys we knew in previous weeks. Dable announced last week, McMahon before the Super Bowl. So the three new names today, which we'll discuss a little bit more, offensive line coach Jack McNell. He is the son of Jack McNell Sr., who is a longtime head coach uh, in the college ranks and in NFL Europe. And he's also the brother of former Chiefs assistant Bob McNell, who's now with Chan Gailey in Buffalo. Bob McNell was a hire from Herm Edwards, and then he came uh, on for Todd Haley's first year in 2009. The other uh, two additions, offensive quality control coach, and I've already got a lot of feedback from this guy from our fans online, Jim Bob Cooter. That's not his real name. I believe it's like James Richard, but he goes by Jim Bob. So Jim Bob Cooter is in the house for the Chiefs, as is special teams quality control coach Darius Swinton. A couple things of note. Obviously, we talk, we've talked about Dable on this show last week. I wrote plenty of uh, information on him about the, the up-tempo, the fast attacking offense. We've kind of looked at Tom McMahon, but what about the three new guys? I'll, I'll post this article on CaseyChiefs.com a little bit later today, but what sticks out to me about Jack McNell, what I like about him, is the fact that this is a guy who has previous head coaching experience at the college level. I am a big proponent of hiring former head coaches, especially from the college level to coach position coach, to be position coaches at the NFL. I just think there's some sort of intangible there with when you're dealing with school administration, when you're dealing with recruits, when you're dealing with the media, when you're dealing with boosters. It, it builds this personality trait that you can't get anywhere else. I don't even think at the NFL level is that to a bit of a degree but college level, you're dealing with parents. You're dealing with so many different things. You learn how to deal with different personalities. And I think that translates well as a position coach at the NFL level. Let's think of the most successful coaches from the position coaches, at least from a production standpoint of the past few years. Charlie Weiss. In his one year here, Matt Castle goes 27 touchdowns, 7 INTs, and the Chiefs offense is the number one ranked rushing offense in the league. Obviously, he's now the head coach at the University of Kansas, but he was a former head coach at Notre Dame. Charlie Wise got the best out of his position group. Gary Gibbs, the Chiefs linebackers coach, a former head coach at the University of Oklahoma. Let's look across the board of the linebackers. You could say this is the strongest and most impressive position group on this football team. Pro Bowler Derek Johnson, Pro Bowler Tom Bahali. Chiefs Rookie of the Year, Justin Houston, and you've got your bring my lunch pail to work every day, blue collar thumper in Javon Belcher. Gary Gibbs, Charlie Wise, two success stories, and with the Chiefs heading into a critical time at their offensive line position, because you know there's going to be turnover on the O-line, you know there's going to be new faces, you know that there's two developing guys the Chiefs are counting on, John Asamoa to return for his second season as star, still has some ways to go in his development, the Chiefs are ex extremely uh, excited about him. He's got a promising future, but he's still developing. Rodney Hudson, you assume that Casey Wigman's going to retire. Right now, he would be your starting center, it would appear. And if that's the case, that's two young guys. You've got to mold some veterans because the Chiefs will improve this offensive line through free agency, through the draft. I think the offensive line hire was a huge hire for this Chiefs team. Not only did they go out and get a Super Bowl winning coach, a guy who has the bloodline, from the Bicknell family and a guy with previous head coaching experience, but they also got him late because that job was supposed to be Bill Muir's. Not the OC job, but the O-line coach job was supposed to be Bill Muir's. He decided to hang it up about two weeks ago was it. 
The Chiefs got a late start on that search, and I think they found a great guy in Jack Bicknell uh, uh, Jr. at the offensive line coach. Uh, Jim Bob Cooter and Darius Swinton, uh, what's interesting about those two guys, they actually worked together on the staff as GAs at the University of Tennessee. Swinton was on the defensive side, worked with Eric Berry, and uh, Jim Bob Cooter was on the offensive side. Then he went ahead and worked in Indianapolis the previous three seasons where, get ready, conspiracy theorists, he worked with Peyton Manning a little bit. So all of you Manning to Kansas City folks out there in Chiefs Nation, have a little bit of fuel to your fire with the addition of Jim Bob Cooter. But I think really what he does is he takes over the job of Nick Sirianni as the offensive quality control coach and kind of that quarterback's wide receiver's liaison to the rest of the coaching staff, which brings us to Mr. Sirianni. Three years in the offensive quality control role, and now he has been promoted to wide receivers coach. Uh, once it was known that he had been retained, I think the writing was on the wall. Romeo Cornell kind of hinted last week he had an idea in mind. Sirianni's worked a lot with the quarterbacks in his time in Kansas City, but over the past year, especially last season, when Jim Zorn was brought in to be quarterbacks coach, and Jim Zorn was not the offensive coordinator, it was Bill Muir, Sirianni could spend more time on other positions. He helped out a lot with the wide receivers. The writing was on the wall for Sirianni to become the wide receivers coach. Well-deserved as a guy who's worked his way up the ranks, a young head coach, three years in that quality control role, and now he is wide receivers coach. And, uh, and again, Swinton was, uh, in addition to his knowledge of Eric Berry, he spent the last three years working under Tom McMahon, the special teams coach, in St. Louis. So in essence, the Chiefs took the St. Louis Rams special team staff, brought him here to Kansas City, and the lone change in that staff is Swinton is a special teams quality control coach, Essentially, he replaces Pat Perlis, who was the assistant offensive line coach. The Chiefs will not have an assistant offensive line coach this year. So that's really the only structural change uh, with the Chiefs coaching staff. Of course, Jim Zorn will return as quarterback's coach after interviewing for that offensive coordinator job, but not getting it several weeks ago. So there you have it. The 2012 Kansas City Chiefs coaching staff is finalized. And now we're ready to move on towards 2012, towards free agency. I know it's a big day in Chiefs Nation. A lot of chatter with Stanford Route on his visit today to Kansas City. He is making the tours. was in Buffalo on Monday. Has interest uh, in going and visiting the Minnesota Vikings, the Tennessee Titans, uh, the Minnesota Vikings, I, I believe I just said. So uh, a number of places this guy is going. He's in demand. He's obviously the number one free agent available right now, right this minute after being released by Oakland last week. We'll get into that on today's show. Mitch Holtis will join us as well on the show today, Voice of the Chiefs. We haven't seen him for a while. I think he's about to turn into Voice of the Iowa State Cyclones. This guy, every time you look, is, is calling a Cyclones game, but he's going to spend some time with us today, and I'm going to get his thoughts on free agency, and we're going to talk about the Chiefs' top needs and some of the top free agents out there. This is going to be a free agent-centered show. Next week we'll move towards the NFL Combine a little bit where we, where we start – our full week planted in Indianapolis, and we'll bring you some great, um, great coverage from Indy. And of course, tonight, the time you've all been waited for, how could it be a better day? Valentine's Day and the 2012 Kansas City Chiefs cheerleaders will be revealed. The girls, if you're watching this show right now, you were told 3 p.m. by your cheer director, Stephanie Judah, don't break our site at 3 p.m. I think it's going to be closer to the evening. It's going to be in video format. And for those of you who follow me on Twitter at Josh Looney, you saw a lot of pictures from cheer tryouts this past week. Uh, but we've got the video. We're going to announce this squad through video highlights. It will be, uh, it'll be an interesting, interesting squad this year. A lot of great rookie talent. And I do not think it will disappoint. So make sure you come to KCChiefs.com later on this afternoon for the unveiling of the 2012 Kansas City Chiefs cheerleader counter. Let's get into free agency. Let's talk about guys in-house. Before we start anything, when we talk about Stanford Route, we'll talk about Mike Tolbert, Ben Jarvis, Green Ellis. We'll, we'll go down the Chiefs' position of need, look at the offensive tackle situation in the league and who's out there. But everyone wants to make a splash in free agency, and right now the Chiefs have the cap room to do so. So what should the Chiefs' biggest priority be in free agency? If you want to make a splash, well, let's go to Pete Prisco's top 50 free agents from CBSSports.com. And you'll notice in the top 10, there are two Kansas City Chiefs. Number two, he's got the number two ranked free agent on the board, 
Brandon Carr. So when you think, I want to go out and make a splash in free agency, if the Chiefs can lock up Brandon Carr, according to Pete Prisco, and most people have Carr in their top five, they'll be getting the number two free agent on the market only to Mario Williams of the Houston Texans. And look who comes in at number nine, wide receiver Dwayne Bowe of the Kansas City Chiefs. You lock up Bowe, you lock up Carr, whether it's a long-term deal, whether it's the franchise tag, you've knocked out 20% of Pete Prisco's top 10 list of free agents. I would say that's a good start to free agency. Now, Chiefs fans want to improve the team from the outside as well, but that's the first thing to keep in mind. You want to make a splash in free agency. The big names for the Chiefs this year, and this doesn't happen every year, the Chiefs' big names are the league's big names this year. Dwayne Bow, Brandon Carr, big names in Kansas City, but big names around the other 31 NFL franchises as well. The Chiefs have, obviously, some work in front of them over the next month. We're now less than 30 days away from the start of free agency, March 13th at 3 p.m. Central Time. Free agency will officially kick off. And, of course, if you're following us on CaseyChiefs.com, I'm giving you a breakdown of 30 different free agents in 30 days. That's going to take us right to March 12th. And then March 13th is when the real stuff gets started. Of course, a guy like Stanford Route could be available and signed today, for all we know, in Kansas City. So let's talk about Stanford Route. What exactly does Stanford Route's visit to Kansas City mean, especially with the Chiefs having Brandon Carr. Is it a sign that negotiations with Brandon Carr are going wrong? They're going bad, and the Chiefs are not going to be able to re-sign Brandon Carr. Is it negotiating power? Is it leverage against Brandon, power, uh, Brandon Carr to say, hey, Stanford route's in town. We're interested in this guy. We've done our breakdown of him. He's the top free agent available right now until March 13th. Then he will not be the top, but he'll still be obviously in the upper tier of free agents. Brandon Carr, we are going to the market, and you know what? If, if you want a certain amount that we're not willing to give, we, we've got a guy in Stanford out that we want. That could be a positioning as well, but the real answer is we don't know what's going on behind the closed doors at Arrowhead and bring in Stanford Route for a visit, no matter what it may be. If the Chiefs want to sign him, if they want to use his negotiating power, whatever's going on behind the scenes, bring in Stanford Route for a visit is good business. It just makes sense. Now, Stanford Route has had a seven-year NFL career. He's a little bit older than Brandon Carr. Uh, you look at his stats, he, he has a little higher burn percentage than Brandon Carr. He's one, he was one of the more highly penalized players in the league last season at his position. That's not something I'm completely uh, concerned about. You know, we know the Raiders were a highly penalized team. And in the secondary, uh, the DB should be getting flagged a lot because being a defensive guy that I am, yeah, it, quarterback is the hardest position to play in the NFL. You can barely touch a receiver without it being a five-yard penalty and automatic first down. Essentially, you have to go out there and shadow a player and not touch him in the open field against some of the best athletes in the league, and that's your job on an island every day for everyone to watch. I don't mind penalties uh, in the league, especially if they're smart penalties. If a guy's got to step on you, take the hold, give him the automatic first down. Uh, the penalties on route isn't something I'm concerned about. I know a lot of people have talked about his penalties last year. It would be more about his age and, and the give and take with Brandon Carr. So Brand, uh, Stanford route in Kansas City today, uh, what does it mean? To be honest with you, I really have no idea, and I'll ask him to told us what his take on it, but my take is it's good business either way. Whether the Chiefs are serious, whether it's a negotiating ploy, Stanford route in town is a good thing for this team, and really it's a good way to shut off free agency, I think, for fans, because you think, all right, this team's going to be active this year. Uh, they've got cap space. They're trying to re-sign their own players, and with that cap space also, mind you, there's guys like Glenn Dorsey, Brandon Albert, and a number of other free agents for next season, too, uh, that the Chiefs are going to be looking to extend probably within the next uh, year and a half or so. You think uh, of the, the list goes on and on when you look at guys like Tom Bahali, Brandon Flowers, Derek Johnson, Jamal Charles, all, all of them signing extensions within the last year. Ryan Suckup, Brandon Seiler, who was injured last year. So the Chiefs have been trying to keep their in-house names, and Brandon Carr, Dwayne Bowe are at the top of that list. The Stanford route coming to Kansas City, not a bad way to start off uh, free agency. We talked coach additions. We talked Stanford route. Let's talk a little bit about the Chiefs position by position until Mitch Holthus gets in here. The visit from route highlights the secondary, but cornerback, whether the Chiefs re-sign Carr, re-sign route, or I guess would sign route, isn't necessarily the biggest position of need. Once one of those guys are down, the Chiefs are looking pretty solid at corner. 
Uh, you do have Travis Daniels, who's, who's a free agent, but you have Jaleel Brown, who's a young player that the Chiefs like. You have Javier Arenas, who stepped up last year. So once the Chiefs get their starter in place opposite Brandon Flowers, the secondary isn't a huge need for this team. However, I believe the safety position is a need for this team. I think a lot of fans out there are under the assumption, oh, we'll be great when Brandon Carr comes back. We'll be great when Jamal Charles comes back and is back in the mix. When Tony Moyaki's back, we'll be great. Those guys will be back, they'll be at 100%, and they'll be great. That's a bad assumption to make. We know that Jamal Charles is an elite player and a Pro Bowl player. We know that Eric Berry is a Pro Bowl player and elite player. We know that Tony Moyaki, even with his injury history, can be one of the top receiving targets at his position in the National Football League. But to assume that not one, not two, but all three of those guys are going to come back and be the same player they are in 2012 is a bad assumption. Hopefully, for Chiefs fans, all three of those guys come back and play at a high level. But history would tell you with knee injuries and the way players react differently in their rehab, that may not be the case. Lo and behold, and then hopefully this isn't the case, those guys may not be the same player that they were before. You don't know how a body is going to react. So I think safety, running back, tight end, even with Charles Berry and Moyaki coming back, the Chiefs have to address those positions in free agency with quality players who can start. You saw a lack of depth on this team when Eric Berry went down and when John McGraw had a few injuries. The Chiefs have to find a guy who can come in and be a regular starter alongside Barry, alongside Lewis. And heck, this team uses a third safety in a number of sub-package situations. So to assume that Eric Berry will come back, be at the top of his game, and be that player is a bad assumption. Hopefully that's what happens. Hopefully that happens what happens with Jamal Charles. I think it's a bad assumption to make. And when we come back, we'll have Mitch Holfus in studio to get his take on free agency, the Chiefs coaching staff additions, and then we'll get into it position by position, what he thinks about some of the top players at each free agency position and where he thinks the Chiefs will move forward as we are now less than a month till we kick off the start of free agency. We'll be right back in a few minutes with Voice of the Chiefs, Mitch Holfus. Together, we are music. Hearts beating to the same drum. We are many, but we are one. Brothers of the Sun. The concert event of the year. Brothers of the Sun Tour. Superstars Kenny Chesney, Tim McGraw. With Grace Potter and the Nocturnals and Jake Owen. Tickets will go on sale Friday, December 9th at 10 a.m. The new Chiefs team store is located on the Founders Plaza on the north side of the new Arrowhead Stadium. Open on game days and from 10 to 6 Monday through Saturday throughout the season, the team store has the largest selection of Chiefs merchandise in the Kansas City area. Featuring official sideline apparel from Reebok and you can shop 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at kcchiefs.com. They sacrifice, they protect, they answer the call at all times. They are the men and women of our armed forces, and their will, heart, dedication, and service to the country that we call home is nothing less than extraordinary. Return the favor. Text the word return to 90999 now for your $10 donation, or simply visit returnthefavor.org. Please join us in returning the favor. Welcome back to Chiefs Live, brought to you by your Midwest Ford dealers. Mitch Holt is making his first appearance in a few weeks. Been on the road, Big 12 basketball, voice of the Cyclones, voice of the Texas Tech Red Raiders. <laughs> Anytime I'm watching those two teams, I'm hearing the sweet, soothing sound. Of course, you had a great game this past weekend, Baylor and Mizzou. Uh, and Mizzou, two top 10 programs going at it. But glad to uh, get you off the road and back in studio. Great to be back with my, uh, I just tweeted, back with my 65 TPT peeps. feel like uh, reunited and back with you, but... Uh, yeah, it's been 15 games in 38 days since the Broncos' victory in six different states on 10 different campuses. But here's what I'm doing. I'm looking for talent. Because you know what? I do talk with NFL guys all across the country, and they say, if you, you know, hey, there's a, everybody's looking for the next Antonio Gates. 
for the next Tony Super. Gonzalez, the next college basketball guy that can be an NFL player? I got two. T. Rob at Kansas, Thomas Robinson could be a tight end, the way he's so fluid with his feet and his hands and his power. And the other is Royce White of Iowa State. You mentioned the Cyclones. Royce White you know could yourself play. Some cyclones. He could play in the National Football League. Hands, power, the guy's a beast. But yeah, I would. Uh, you're always looking for that it's, basketball it's guy. You bring that up. I think it was Saints last week's show, two weeks show. We opened with uh, you know Blake Griffin's crazy dunk, that powerful dunk, and that's what we opened the show talking about. Is Blake Griffin could play in the NFL as a tight end, and we talked about Tony and Jimmy Graham and and, and Jimmy Graham and, and Gates and guys guys that. Uh, kind of transition into that. But while you've been gone, Mitch, it's Marcus doing... Pollard was uh, <laughs> never played college football. He just played college basketball at Bradley because they don't have football. And he blew up, was awesome for the Colts for all those years. So well, I'm always looking, man, always looking for we, talent. We got our, our basketball slash football scout, the transition Mitch told us uh, on behalf of the Chiefs. So, and I'm been... no Brad Young. I'm sorry. I'm very intimidated being sitting right here. I'm, if you see the sweat roll down my face, because I'm no Brad Young. I know that. I'm just Brad Young, big time to say. You know what he's doing right now? I have no he clue. Is cutting up the video of uh, the that we'll post on the site this evening of the girls who make the Kansas City Chiefs. It's like squad. Selection Sunday. It is. It's Selection tournament. Sunday. It's so Selection course, he's Tuesday. Like, he's like, oh, Josh, I've really got to uh, hover over this video. Can't make it today. Sorry. No, this is, i got to hover over this thing and, and make sure i got the right shots. So. But that's how the announcements are going to be made, right? That's, oh, that's how it's made. That's it's what online. Last year, and gonna it's gonna, you're going to see it's not a picture Selection of the girl. Tuesday. You're going to see part of her routine, and it's actually a pretty cool way to do uh to do this life. So selection on Tuesday online. on Valentine's Day. Well, you've been and props to <laughs> Stephanie Judah, the coach of the cheerleaders, yeah. who's amazing. The way she, she's really a great part of the spirit and momentum and, and uh, aura of this place because she does such a great job and works so hard and recovering, just like Eric Berry and Tony Moyaki and Jamal Charles from a serious injury. Hope to have her back by, you know, at least by uh, OTAs. She suffered the Achilles injury. <sighs> Tough one. Uh, a tough, a tough injury. She's on crutches, but uh, she stormed through it, and I was uh, once She's again pleased awesome. to be part of the uh, guest judges for. Of course, you know I'm a guest judge, but they had like Danny Boatwright, Casey Wigman's wife, was there. You had uh, Melina Scantlin, the person at TV. They're probably a little bit better on the guest judging scene. Survivor, than The Bachelor, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they've been hey, on big time I, TV. I, what have I'm, you been I'm on? I'm just in the back. This show. Chief Slide. Come Chief's on, you, you got it right here. While you've been gone, Mitch. Uh, you know, doing your uh, game every two days. The, the Romeo Cornell's been busy uh, building a staff. The staff got finalized today. I addressed it at the beginning of this show. Uh, real quick, your thoughts on, I guess, let's just go with offensive coordinator Brian Dable. Your thoughts on his want to come in and make it an up-tempo, an attacking offense. Well, I mean, let me just say this globally about what Romeo has done. And the positive thing, if you're a Chiefs fan, is he's maintained the good things, the continuity that you want to keep. So it's not like you're starting all over. And, you know, I've talked about, hey, you need to hit the open seas and quit dodging icebergs. I think this team is real close to doing that. But had to keep the continuity of what's been good over the past two years. I think he did that. And yet looking at change, because many fans thought, oh, it's just going to be the same staff. It's going to be a rubber stamp, and they just go into 12 like they did in 11. But he has shown making, you know, I think some dramatic movements on the offensive side of the ball and on special teams. But with Dable, the only thing I can say about him is in preparation for the Miami game, when we played the Dolphins in that first weekend in November. He out-schemed us. He, he did, but you're getting close to home there because who's the defensive coordinator? Hey, Ra that Rack will take that. I, I know. He, he'll say it. There was we, some out-flanking and out-scheming there. In fact, but when I did the preparation that week, I go, how are these guys 0-7? I saw what he was able to do by formation and by personnel, and once he got his guys pretty much healthy, of course, the quarterback situation was fluid, but once he got Bush and was able to get him in mismatches, you know, with Brandon Marshall, Fasano, the tight Charles end, Clay, Charles Clay, Daniel Thomas, yeah. the kid from K-State, I thought, wow. And I even maybe mentioned that week on the show on the Chiefs Talk Live that it was going to be really tense. I didn't have a great feeling about that game, but Dable did a great job in that game. And I'm thinking if he's that imaginative and you get all the weapons back, then I think Chiefs fans need to be excited about this move because I think he's going to think, like Todd used to say, think outside the box. And you're going to have a chance to create some mismatches and use your talent. I'm also a big fan of Jack McNell Jr., uh, especially mm -hmm. since the Chiefs got on that search late. It's a really important position this year with you know there's going to be some change in the offensive line. You've got two guys in Osimo and Hudson who need to continue to develop. Uh, you've got a new offense in store. And, and here's the underrated part. Uh, it looks like Casey Whitman's going to retire. So if Hudson takes over center, you've got to be the guy who's the quarterback of that offensive line. It's a critical job. And the fact that they got somebody 
uh, as experienced as Jack McNeil Jr. with his family bloodlines and the fact that he was a, a college head coach at Louisiana Tech, which, mind you, they were ranked at one year. Louisiana Tech Bulldogs were ranked with him. They beat Alabama when Alabama right. won the SEC. Uh, I like this hire. It was an important hire. It came late in the process, and to get him, even though it was late, I think was a huge score for the Chiefs. I think he brings a strong edge, and, and the offensive line to me I think becomes the most paramount group going into 2012. I like these guys. It, it, last year was a little bit tough on them at times, but one thing you hear me talk about for a vast improvement has got to be in the red zone or winning the line of scrimmage. This has now become a very physical line of scrimmage division. If you look at what Oakland is able to do with their front seven, underrated, one of the top five in the league in my opinion, San Diego is physical up front, Denver's defense is physical up front. It was shadowed in the whole T-boneness. But I think the offensive line, just going right down the line, whether uh, you know, Lilja can get healthy again. I think he fought through some injuries last year. John Osamo was up and down. But I have a great promise. I think he's got great promise because he can be a physical attacker at the line of scrimmage. I'm excited for Rodney. I think he's a smart guy. Wegg's retiring. What a fa fabulous career. But Rodney's the kind of guy who's bright enough and tough enough, I think, that he can be the same kind of uh, you know, Pro Bowl caliber center. And then at the tackles, we continue to talk about that. But things have got to get better on that end of the ball. They were not very explosive. With the injuries, I can understand it. Their longest run was 34 yards. There were times they struggled, the fourth and a link of a chain to try to make a first down against Oakland uh, in the red zone. The red zone has got to improve. That's going to be the huge area for this team. And it's one area where actually Dable was pretty good uh, with the Miami Dolphins, much better than the Chiefs. So uh, the offensive line to me is first and foremost when I look at everything involving this team. All right, let's talk free agency. That's where we're going to go with the rest of this show as fans are uh, clamoring for the big date, March 13th, 3 o'clock p.m. Central, to hit. And really, we have our first uh, free agency signing as Stamper Route released last week in Oakland is here today for a visit uh, in Kansas City. Your take on that situation and, and what it means? Well, you know, he's got a lot of experience in the league, and it's, and it's interesting when you play a guy in your division, you get to see him. You know, you're, you're maybe more critical of him because you try to find his weaknesses and try to figure out a way to attack him. But in that, also in that same uh, vein, you also see his strengths. Now, people can read a lot into this visit. They can read in too much into this visit. There's a lot of discussion about Brandon Carr, and of course he has to be re-signed. You know, will they franchise him? They work out a new deal? I don't know. Even if you have a Stanford route on your team, let's just assume that you go ahead and decide and take Stanford route. It really improves you at the nickel situation, and it gives Rack and Emma Thomas a lot of choices back there because you want a multiplicity of guys. Then you can kind of figure out how you want to use Javier Arenas. You can kind of go big dime, basically, if you have a Stanford route um, and put Javier and route back there at the same time. And now you've got a strong caliber group there if you re-sign Carr. But you can then send Javier. Maybe the best thing he does is blitz out of a nickel or dime situation. Uh, but it gives you a multiplicity of opportunities, and you can't have enough depth at cornerback. Cornerback is like pitching in Major League Baseball. You can't have enough quality corners, particularly in a league that now goes to more three wide and four wide. Four it's wide. the most difficult position to play in the NFL, and that's interesting because Travis Daniels, who was the dime back last year, an unrestricted free agent, been uh, around the league a while. So I guess your setup there could make some sense if uh, – if, if, if Route was wanting to come in and, and be a nickel, he obviously has a lot of suitors and probably will have a chance to be a starter for some team as he uh, has already visited Buffalo. They're in desperate need right. uh, of help in the secondary. Uh, he has a visit scheduled with the Titans with Cortland Finnegan set to hit unrestricted free agent. They, should, they could be looking for a starter. Uh, and then Houston, Minnesota, and Dallas are also interested. But uh, <laughs> the Chiefs are able to, to get Carr to a long-term deal and get Stanford Route. I'd say the uh, fans would be pretty darn happy with, and the, you keep with, with that defense. And, and, you then keep you got, and then you look at your safety position, which I know you talked to before the break. But then, you know, it depends Jaleel Brown, who can be kind of a hybrid corner safety guy. You can go big nickel, where you have a three safety, two corner. Go three corner, two safety, and go one safety, four corner. But you've got a good enough fit. You know, Javier's physical enough where you can send him. If you can cover that mid range area and you got route to cover deep, you can do a ton of different things. And one of the things we know about Romeo Cornell, he loves to be creative defensively. And the more toys you can give him, 
the more havoc he could wreak with that defense in 2012. Well, let's keep it in the secondary because one of my biggest position of needs for the Chiefs is, is one that's kind of against the grain. It's one that not many people have as a position of need, and, and it's the safety position. And you look at you, the free agency snapshot, John McGraw, an unrestricted free agent, Sabi Piscatelli, an unrestricted free agent, and uh, Richard Langford, an exclusive rights guy. They can get him back should they wish. So basically you have right now, if it were today, uh, if all goes well with Eric Berry, he's a starter at Strong, Kendrick Lewis a starter at Free, and then you'd have Don Washington and probably Kendrick Lewis as their backups. Now, what we saw last but year... But I'm going to throw Jaleel Brown in that And crew. Jaleel Brown can be a hybrid yeah. type of guy. Now, but here's what we saw happen last year. When Eric Berry went down, John McGraw came in, he was your experienced veteran, then he started getting hurt. That, it, we were razor thin at safety, and a lot of people are assuming, and I think it's a wrong assumption, I think... Eric Berry could very well come back and be the same pro ball player. But until he gets on that field and until you actually see it, which we're not going to see it until after free agency begins, until you would think they'd probably take it slow with those guys in OTAs, you're probably not going to see him really on the field hitting guys and, 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 and doing everything he has to do at the safety position until preseason, until training camp. Right. So you can't assume, Mitch, that, that the guy is going to come back at full strength. You can check his progress, but the reality of it, it knee, knee injuries, everyone recovers differently. Everyone uh, reacts differently, and, and hopefully he, bec he becomes a better player. Priest Holmes said he thought he was faster right. after a knee surgery, but you just don't know, which when you looked at the situation last year and the thinnest, I think that safety is a position of need. So there are guys on the open market, which I find intriguing. A guy like Leron Landry out of Washington. He's a former top uh, ten pick for the Redskins. He's been injured the last two years. Okay, he's had an Achilles injury. He's really kinda, athletic, though. He's kind of going through a thing right now with Washington, where he does not want Achilles surgery. Washington wants him to have the Achilles surgery, so he's paying for these stem cell treatments and bizarre uh, things on his own. So this is a guy where, for the right price, he he's a guy that that. It's, it's one of those deals where he's a, he could be a low-risk, short-term contract guy if he deal. Maybe his contract deals with incentives uh, on playtime. But it's a guy who's been a starter, who was a Pro Bowl alternate, alternate his first two seasons in the league. When he got hurt in 2010, he was leading the league in tackles. Started for Jim Zorn's Washington Redskins, mm -hmm. 31 of uh, Zorn's 32-game tenure in Washington. So there's players like this, like this guy who could have value. Uh, and, and not just Landry. There, there are other guys like uh, like... Tavon Branch from Oakland, like Michael Griffin are out there. But guys with starting experience that, that have a little, that maybe aren't going to be able to beat out Eric Berry, but they're a great other, other plan. <laughs> you need a third safety, and you also need a fourth safety for special teams and the way Romeo likes to play. Let me give you three responses here. When Landry came out, I'm not, I mean, he was... Dwayne Bowe signing class at LSU, high school signing class. Stud. I mean, power and athleticism. Brings the wood when he plays the position, but is athletic enough to cover. That's the way he's been kind of in his career. All right, let's talk with Eric Berry. Now let's start with Richard Langford and the, and the safety thin position. Two gigantic plays. There were so many huge plays in December. The Chiefs still had a chance to win the division. When I was doing an x-ray, I went through all the 500-page stat ink report, and I'm thinking, wow, to statistically the Chiefs look a lot closer to 3-13 and 13 than they did 7-9. and nine. It's a tribute to this team and the way they fought through it. But let's go back to December and how many big plays there were that you could say cost the team the division. Two big plays. Actually, November, the long pass, the one completion for 55 yards to Decker was blown coverage with an inexperienced safety. Okay? One of Tebow's three completions. One of his, day. okay. But it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the game. Yep, Oakland the game, same thing. thing. Oakland game, same thing. Blown, blown coverage by a safety who hadn't played that position very much. You need corners like you need pitching in baseball, but you need safeties like you need middle infielders in baseball because you can't get enough. But I still, there's, there's some guys here within the, the walls that you could also see could, could develop into that role, like a Jaleel Brown, who's physical enough to, to play both corner and safety. So, uh, but you need that corner because, again, you can play big nickel, as I mentioned, with three safeties, two corners, and, you know, smaller nickel, smaller dime. Um, but I, I'm with you on safety because it, it became a position that, Really, uh, in a way, you don't want to say that position cost the team the playoffs, but there are some big plays that if you have a more experienced safety in there, like an Eric Berry, then uh, you got a chance because there were some big plays given up at that point. Now, let's talk about Eric Berry's injury. And Kendrick Lewis, I love this guy because he reminds me of a Duran Cherry type. 
you know, the way he leads the defense. And these guys all look at Kendrick, the way he studies, the way he leads the team with his calls, including a Brandon Flowers. Brandon Flowers, when Kendrick talks, BDOT will listen to him. Eric Berry is the one guy I haven't talked to. I have talked to Tony Moyaki, you know, and talking to him and his rehab's going well, and, and talked to Jamal and his rehab's going well. And in the, uh, the instance, I've not had a chance to talk with EB. The only blessing, there's a couple things here that are positives for Chiefs fans. One, the technology and the medicine for ACL injury and recovery and repair is ex grown exponentially in the last five years. We all know that. Two, those guys were all hurt early. Okay, they were all hurt early in the year, which hurt 2011, but it helps your rehab because then all of a sudden you've got a chance because of when those injuries occurred late August, early September, that they can go in. You ease them into OTAs, ease them into minicamp, but by the time training camp gets here, you can flip the switch and go. There's some other guys in the league, including guys that were blew an ACL. Jim Peterson. Blows an ACL late, in the Super Bowl, year. and all of a sudden that and affects Ballard, his yeah. entire 2012 Ballard of the Giants. So um, anyway, there's, there's a... Uh, I just I, I feel positive about that group, but you're right. That's a place where you add a safety, you get the right corner, and you can do some major damage because I love the linebacking core. I think the linebacking core has a chance to be Steeler-esque or Raven-esque. Yeah, I, I feel positive about it too, and I, I believe all these guys will be fine when they come out. But it, it's also, I think, at the fan base, from everybody I've talked to online and the feedback I get, th there needs to be a bit of a reality check that these were, there's three guys, and they're, when you have knee surgery, that's still significant. It is. And the assumption that... They're just going to be able to come right back. That, that's a, it's a tough assumption because it is a knee surgery, and, and I do have confidence they'll be back, but I think it's a bad assumption to make that all three will be uh, the same guy. That if you're asking me to bet, I'm betting on all three of those guys. And well, sometimes, guys, if you look at ACLs, they are come back their second year is even stronger than the first. I know fantasy football folks will look at ACL running backs, and there's kind of that one year where they get back in, and then – and then they're back in the second year, and they're right back to the player. Every player takes a different amount of time, and, and that's really the only thing I'm trying to offer the reality check on. Is no, I, I, it's, I think you need to give that warning out there. Um, and with ACL injuries, believe me, I've, I've got women basketball players in my house. I mean, I, my wife played Division I's had four surgeries, and my daughter played college basketball, and she's had three or four. Uh, but it's all about the, the rehab and how you handle that. And it, I've not talked to EB, but the other two guys, man, we're on rehab right away. How diligent are you? Because it starts once the swelling goes down and that surgery goes down, it all depends about the rehab. Can you get power and extension, developing all the rest of the muscles around the knees? And that's why knowing the, the mental makeup of these three guys and their physical makeup, I, I'm going to bet on all three that they're going to come back strong. Let's stay on the defensive side of the football. Another position of need, as has been the past few years, nose tackle, Kelly Gregg, 14-game starter. Uh, Scheduled hit on a restricted free agent, contemplating retirement. Uh, and then his backup, who was probably the Chiefs' biggest surprise <laughs> signing, uh, was, was a big player. I'd love to see him come back in, in the, really the same role that he played last year as, as that top backup and, and, and get in there and start a couple games. Amon Gordon also scheduled to hit unrestricted free agency. So a nose tackle leads the Chiefs with Jarrell Poe, who played seven defensive snaps last season, just one game, seven defensive snaps. And, Monday and night we don't football. know which Jarrell We don't Poe. know about we him. We don't know. And Anthony Turbio, who's spent more time on practice squads than he has on active rosters in this league. Another guy you really don't know about. So you look across the league in the free agent list, Mitch, there's a number of nose tackles in 3-4 defenses that are in their 30s, 31, 32 years old, but they have starting experience that are available on the open market. One of them is a guy who reminds me a lot of Sean Smith in the Chiefs situation last year. It's Antonio Gary of the San Diego Chargers. He stepped up and filled in for Jamal Williams when the Chargers moved on from Williams. This Gary guy came into the league as a sixth-round pick in 03, had no sacks, had like 14 tackles, and, uh, and no starts up until the 2010 season. He got a chance to have regular playing time. He hit the scene hard, and he was a low-priced veteran. That, that ended up playing a big role for the Chargers for the last two years. And I compare him to Sean Smith in the ways, well, he's a big personality. This guy wears crazy yeah. hair colors and yeah. drives Hello Kitty smart cars. But it's the, <laughs> fact that, it's, it's the fact that Antonio Gary now is hitting the open market and is, he's going to get paid for the first time in his career. He's going to yeah. get paid just like Sean Smith after he had his good season was paid last year by the Titans, guaranteed three and a half last year. The people here were pretty shocked. They got $8 million from the Titans after, after one season. And, and you look at Sean, I love the guy, but he, uh, he had a rough year this year in Tennessee. So in San Diego, you've got a guy, they're going to have to make a decision. I think there will be a bidding war 
for a player like Gary Services. You know him from yeah. being in the AFC West. Your impressions on a guy like him, and, and not even just specifically him, a player that you know can start in a 3-4 that, that's in that kind of 5-6-7 year range. Well, first of all, this guy was impressive on tape because you think, with a, hey, you don't have to deal with Jamal Williams anymore, and you breathe a sigh of relief, and then this guy shows up. He's better than Sean Smith. This guy's motor, and he's more powerful. And the question I would ask you and everyone else is, do you know a really good 3-4 defense that's pedestrian at nose tackle? And I would tell you the answer is no. If you see Terrence Cody or, or uh, basically Vince Wilfork, he's the poster child for great nose tackles in a 3-4. Wilfork can just destroy a game. And, and honestly, flipping back to the Chiefs' offensive line, they struggled in the last couple of years, quite honestly, going up the last three years against an odd front. When you faced an odd 3-4 front, when that guy's sitting there on the nose, slanting the nose, with both A-gap shading, and just some guy that you've got to shove around, it throws everything off kilter. Now, uh, I thought last year the Chiefs were okay at nose tackle. And, um, you know, I've followed Kelly his whole career and admire that guy a lot. But I'm talking about ratcheting it up a minute. You've got a stud in there, a disruptive force in there that just takes the eats your offensive line and just eats it from the inside out. That's what the great 3-4 defenses do. And I think for this defense to jump forward to be elite, which I think it's getting there because we've just looked at it from back to front. Up front, if you get a nose tackle, that is like a Vince Wilfork, it just takes this defense to another level. And I agree. Gary's a much better player than Sean Smith. I wasn't comparing him as their skill sets, but more or less kind of their NFL careers. Sean Smith was bouncing from team to team just like Gary had yep. and, and was a low-priced veteran. And then they have their big season. They hit the market. They're going to get paid. That was kind of the situation. It, it mirrors what the Chiefs had with Sean Smith. But this guy has year. the motor and power uh, to be – you know, he, he can be that kind of guy and be very disruptive in the, in the middle of that defensive line. We'll talk about disruption in the defensive line. Probably the number one uh, target in, uh, as far as nose tackle goes, in, in free agents this year is a man from the Jets named uh, Sione uh, Buha. Buha. Uh, you probably have the pronunciation better than I do from the game where he just he got after the Chiefs when we went up to New York and, and played them. He's, he was uh, rated by Pro Football Focus as the number one nose tackle in the game last season by their, by their grades. He'd be a high priority re-signing for the Jets, who have, uh, who have some issues on the defensive line. The guy's been a uh, 14, 15, 16 game starter for each of the past three seasons for the Jets. Doesn't get to the quarterback as much as uh, Gary does. He's, his, season, his career high in the single season is two sacks in the 2010 campaign, but he's a guy who you want to find a guy who can hold the two gap and, and be your difference maker. He's either going to get paid by the Jets or he's going to get paid by somebody else. Yeah. He will, and let's keep, let's keep in mind before fans just go crazy here because free agency is a little bit like Black Friday shopping at <laughs> Christmas time, okay? It's like wild on that Friday or Saturday, and then things kind of calm down, right. and then you can really do your shopping. But this guy is a personification of what I'm talking about. He's even better than Gray in the fact that he can, uh, he will just eat you alive, you know, like this virus inside your body, and he was... <laughs> He's just so difficult to block. And then you, it occupies not only your center, it occupies both of your guards, basically, because depending on where he goes and how he moves around. And, yeah, you'd like to have a nose tackle that would crush quarterbacks, but there's enough guys now. There's pass rushers on this team with what Justin Houston was able to do to emerge. If these guys can disrupt, disrupt the offensive line at that zero-tech position, you don't need him to rush the passer and get 10 sacks. You just need him to eat be that virus. Yeah, no style. Definitely a position to watch. One of the Chiefs' top needs heading into free agency. Another top need, offensive tackle, offensive line in general. Now, uh, fans will be quick to say, give us a new left tackle, move Brandon out, but your right tackle, that simple. Barry Richardson can go sign somewhere else. Bada bing, bada boom, we're done. It's great. We've got a, not, not so fast. The free agent, let me tell you who the top free agent tackle right now is, rated by most, is none other than Jared Gaither. So that tells you right now, what the market is like right now as far as offensive tackles that are hitting unrestricted free agency. The offensive line position, interior, with guys like Carl Nix, is strong. On the outside, it's much we weaker. Dem uh, Demetrius Bell from Buffalo is probably right up there with, with Gaither, and the Bills will do everything they can to, to re-sign Bell, who was one of the most improved offensive linemen, I think, in, in all of football last season. But the Chiefs have said, from Clark Hunt to Romeo Cornell to Scott Pioli, have all said within the past month and a half that the offensive line, they're going to address it. They want to build depth. They want to improve the offensive line. So we know changes are coming, whether it's 
Hudson's going to take over for Wigman. Uh, whether the Chiefs sign a, a guard or a tackle, changes are going to come. But this is one where people think a tackle, I think this may be more of a draft need than a free yeah. agency need when you look at the, the cast of characters that are available on the tackle market. A couple things there, Josh. One, last year was the year for free agency tackles. And there were like 20 of them, that were, and a lot of high-caliber guys, but they all resigned with their own team, almost all of them. Yep. And so, it, it, you know, uh, if you, get a, you find a good tackle in this league, whether right or left, and especially left, you keep them. You pay them and keep them and try to build. And uh, so I would agree with you. This might be a position where you draft and can draft highly because depending on the juniors that come out, there are some really good junior tackles, I think, that are slated to come out uh, that you can draft and build there. Now, I would take all the rest of the guys on the offensive line, and again, I like this group. They're, uh, they're a cohesive group. They're a group that can build together, but all of them across the board would probably agree, I've got to be better, and I've got to be more consistent. There are some things they did last year very, very well. Sacks allowed was actually pretty good for the most part when you compare them to other teams, but it's a matter of being consistent. Uh, I mentioned the short yardage situations. In the case of a Barry Richardson, maybe better against the run than he was in, in, in uh, protecting. Here's one of the four rushing touchdowns the Chiefs had in the red zone, and one of them was from Javier Arenas in the Wildcat. I mean, they've got to be better at the point of attack in short yardage and in the red zone of punching these things in there, whether it's by the run or by the pass, and I think it starts with the offensive line. I mean, you see Lilja right there patting him on the head. If Lilja can get healthy, he's nasty inside, uh, and then I think a big key is John Osamoa. I mean, look at the pull here. He's that athletic enough. He gets the pull outside to allow to get the touchdown against the Green Bay Packers. He's got that kind of agility and that kind of power, but they all have to get better. I would say, and here's a downfield block, the best thing that uh, Brandon Albert does is block downfield. They run that sprint draw action. He's great at releasing the guy and getting down and getting because he can run. He's, he's athletic enough, but this was a big play and a play that the Chiefs hopefully can get more of. I mean, they did, it was the biggest play of the year right there in their ground game of 34 yards. But if they all can improve together and you add to the talent pool, make it competitive. They always talk about being competitive going into the offseason, but it is an area that has to improve. Everybody gets better individually, and then you improve what you have there for competition all the way up and down the line. I talked about this on the show, I believe. It might have been two weeks ago, but it might, you may find it surprising. You, mentioned, you may already know the Chiefs actually, you looked at the run game compared to from last year to the 2010 season. Obviously not where it was. You had Jamal Charles Park. But one thing was better. When they ran to the left side behind Ryan Lilja and Brandon Albert, they ran for more yards per carry than they did in 2010. In 2010, it was, over, it was like 5.5 yards. It was 5.6 last season. So both numbers were extremely high. It was up the gut and to the right side where the numbers really dropped off for the Chiefs. Now, Brandon Albert, we know, uh, I, I think, is a, is a, I, he's a top-notch run blocker, I think. It's the passive blocking that he knows and he needs to improve upon, and that's what uh, Bill Muir would say last year at the end of the year. But, so you think a draft, maybe playing a guy on the right side, what exactly happens? I think that's an overlooked part of it, though. Lilja and Albert, I think they did a good job in their run game blocking last season. Well, let's, let's do an overlook many times, even an awesome all, in that instance when you're running left because – this team ran a lot of powers last year. Right. And in a power game, your right guard pulls to the left side. And, and that's what I'm saying. John Asamoa has a chance to be good because he has the ability to do that. When the Chiefs were in their heyday here in the mid-2000s with the, one of the top five offensive lines in the National Football League, you had guys that could run those pulls, inside pulls. Nobody was better than Will Shields in the game, maybe, ever Absolutely. than him at it. And when Waters was in shape, he could do it too. But sometimes your right guy pulling left. But the right side has to be better on the point of attack when it's their turn to block, you know, straight on. So it, it's an excellent point. The key, the difference between 2012 and 2011 in the run game was explosiveness. There were no explosive runs. Right. Some of that's Jamal Charles. I get it. But, and some of that's maybe Thomas Jones with one more year. But the point is they had 80-yard runs, 56-yard runs, 70-yard runs. It's why they led the league in, in the National Football League in rushing the ball. Last year, the longest run was 34 yards. It was just grinding, grinding, grinding all the time. And part of being more explosive is you get an offensive line that not only is at the point of attack play side, you get to the second level. Your wide receivers are involved in that as well. But if you can do that, no matter who's at running back, you've got to be more explosive in the run game in 2012. Well, let's talk about who's going to carry the football then, because I think that's another free agent need. If I'm going to sit here and get on my pedestal and say, well, you better prepare at safety, well, you better prepare at running back too, in the same situation with Jamal Charles. Who is going to be 
the backup feature back. We saw it was running back by committee. They obviously don't want to give Dexter McCluster the football on a 20-carry basis. He, and, and although Bill Muir did say that's one of his regrets last season was kind of pigeonholing McCluster as a small guy, I think he can get a bigger workload than we saw. And we did see that a little bit more in, in down in the last two games of the season. But who's going to be the guy who's proven it past Jamal Charles? What if Jamal doesn't come back from that injury the way he's supposed to? Are you going to have another situation where it's running back by committee? Or are you going to have a guy who can carry the rushing load and who can, who can be a solid backup, a solid contributor, and a short yards? Because you've got Charles, you've got McCluster. There's your speed. What about the power? I like Jackie Battle coming back. However, in free agency, you have some guys that are pretty interesting that would fit very nice in that role. Let's start with Ben Jarvis Green Ellis. He mm -hmm. knows mm -hmm. Brian Dable's mm -hmm. system. Ben Jarvis Green Ellis has been a feature back for the Patriots uh, for several seasons. He's also been, though, he, he's had a 1,000-yard year in 2010, but he's also been able to kind of mix and match with what they have as well with Danny Woodhead when, when Falk was involved. So he's played both roles. Uh, he can be your short yard and stumper. He can take over a game if Jamal Charles was hurt. Uh, this makes a lot of sense in, in, in his makeup, and I'll get to a next guy that makes a lot of sense hitting free agency as well. Your thoughts on Ben Jarvis Green Ellis? This guy becomes, this kind of player becomes a poster child for, I think, what you're talking about is a need for the Chiefs. Let's assume Jamal Charles comes back flying around, which I think he will. You need a combination speed power guy because McCluster becomes your formation guy. You know, much like New Orleans uses Darren Sproles. He can become a formation speed guy. You can see where he can be effective when he's healthy. I think Dex played through a lot of injuries last year. He just kept fighting through it, and I think that was part of his deal. But you've got to minimize his touches, too. This guy becomes, because he's got enough power, he really helped this team this year. They weren't oh, yes. a great running football team, but when they needed to run the ball, this was the guy that ran it for them. And he's got enough pop in his game, Josh, that he just doesn't give you four yards or five yards. He can pop, break a tackle, get you 10, 12, 15. If, if, if Jackie Battle, who I appreciate and like a lot, has to go to another level, it would be get a 15-yard gain. Not just the five, not just the four, the six, but get a 15, 20. That's what I'm talking about being more explosive. Not only the home run hit that a Jamal Charles can give you, but what this guy gave the Patriots all year long, and that is pop for a 15 or 20, keep the drive alive, or keep where New England could stay stable as far as their balance and run pass. And you think of the way that she's kind of underutilized. I think a lot of fans think LaRon McLean last season. You don't know what Brian Dable's plans are for the fullback. You look in Miami, they had kind of a versatile, smaller fullback in Charles Clay, mm -hmm. kind of tied in hybrid. Jackie Battle, people forget, in 09, was lining up at fullback at sometimes, too. Right. If that's the type of offense you want, don't count that out as well. So a guy like Ben Jarvis Green Ellis could, could make a lot of sense. And, of course, maybe Laurel McLean will come back. He said he wants to, but uh, his, his set is up in the air. But another guy who's hit free agency, and this is the one that will get Chiefs fans uh, all riled up and the, probably the most requested guy <laughs> br to bring in other than Peyton Manning this offseason I'm hearing is Mike Tolbert of the San Diego Chargers uh, in that same mold of, of uh, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis but even thicker and a guy who can put his hand in the dirt and play fullback for you. He's obviously uh, taken a feature role at times but you look at the Chargers situation uh, they want him back, he wants to go back, but I don't think they're going to break the bank to get him back. They're going to have to re-sign Jacob Hester. They have Ryan Matthews there already. They could easily draft a guy in the middle rounds to kind of take over for the job that, that Tolbert did. So my thought is this guy can be bought on the open market, and I think he will leave San Diego, whether it's with the Chiefs or the, some other team that needs a guy. I, I think their situation uh, alludes to a possibility to, to snag him in free agency. Your thoughts on Tolbert from watching him and how a, a player like he, he would fit in with the Chiefs offense? Small school guy. Came from Coastal Carolina. He was there with Thigpen when they just started that program out of nothing. It was like instant oatmeal. Boom, they got football, the Shannon Clears. I liked him when he came into the league because he accepted his role, but this guy runs pads to the ground. He's got some power to him because he's going to get the pads lowered. Um, and the question is, does he want to be a number one back? I don't know if he's going to get number one back money, but, but I would agree with you. Uh, 
the question is receiving, and I haven't, I haven't studied his receiving stats enough to know because what he I would had say with 54 catches last year, because I know Philip Rivers just likes to dump it off. He to, dumps it to the backs. He throws miss. the backs more than any guy and in the league. And Darren Sproles off that team has really hurt them because he likes to dump the I'm backs. I'm telling you, that's and I brought. I mean, that's what I said <laughs> in October. Yeah, but the, the point is, uh, one that role you got to have a combination of power and speed. You also have to have a combination of being able to pass protect and um, catch passes out of the backfield, short and medium range. And three, maybe you get some special teams out of it because at that spot, that guy's going to be able to play all four suits of the hand no matter what's Trump. And I do like Tolbert. I might like Ben Jarvis Greenhouse just a little bit better because I think he's maybe got maybe just a little more pop than Tolbert does, but there's a lot to like about Mike Tolbert. Uh, and I, th I picked those two guys out. There's actually a pretty talented class of uh, free agent running backs, but the ones that I, that I think would make the most sense here and maybe had the best chance to, to land here given their situations would be Tolbert and Green Ellis. Other guys who are hitting free agency or scouts through Ray Rice in Baltimore, you think they, they'd keep him. Matt Forte, they're going to franchise him in Chicago. Uh, Mar Marshawn Lynch probably will hit free agency, you would think, in, in Seattle. Um, Peyton Hillis, who knows what's going to happen with him in, uh, in Cleveland. And then uh, you want to go with an older guy, Cedric Benson. Well, just don't be on the Cincinnati. cover of Madden. That's just, what Yeah, don't, don't, be, uh, don't be the Madden. But this is also, the, I mean, this has been kind of proven, too, with a big database of, of research that this is a place you can draft and immediately have a contributor. If you want somebody that can going to draft and contribute right away, it's been running back, you know, demanding, depending on the role that you have for that, that person. So... This is also maybe in the later rounds where you can find a back. These guys that you mentioned, where was Ben Jarvis Green Ellis drafted? Uh, and, and, of course, Tolbert was down the line a little bit too. So you can find sometimes a younger version of these guys that can give you that balance of speed power, hopefully teach them how to pass protect, catch passes, maybe be on teams, and give you that perfect complement to a Jamal Charles and the rest of your running back com uh, group that you've got. Mitch, we know uh, we're, we're winding down in the show, but we got to talk quarterback before, before we sign off here. The Chiefs have said they want to the bring ones. in competition for Matt Castle. Uh, you look at the list of free agent quarterbacks, where is that competition going to come from if it's not through the draft? Kyle Orton may be the best situation out there. He may be the most competitive for Matt Castle, the one that makes the most sense here. I mean, you look at other guys in this league that are, that are going to become free agents. You've got guys like Rex Grossman. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of those lower tier of, of free agent quarterbacks, and, and Orton is the most intriguing, which is both good and bad. It makes sense for the Chiefs. However, with, with the free agent market the way it is, he may have a lot of other suitors that want him sure. to come and, and, and compete for their starting job. Uh, we, we talked about on the season, but, but your thoughts on the possibility of, of Orton coming back and, and really more where, where do you think that competition is going to come against Matt Castle as a guy who's going to compete? Because we don't think Ricky Stanzi's quite there yet, he, and, and I don't think he's going to give a true push to, uh, for Matt. Where, where does that competition come from? Well, man, this is a uh, real complicated discussion because involved in this discussion are a couple of different factors one, what do you do with your free agents, Brandon Carr and Dwayne Bowe? Okay, the reason I say that is do you franchise one of those two? You do have the franchise card to play on one of those two. So, and you're going to spend some dollars there. And what the Chiefs have done very well and they not received enough credit for it is the way they keep their core players with this team. We've said it before, but you've got to understand, Derek Johnson being here, Brandon Flowers being here, Tom Bahali being here under contract, you've kept the core of your team together. Uh, Kyle Orton, I loved him in the last, and what he did for this team the last three weeks. He was very Matt Castle-like in the way he won over the locker room. These guys love Matt Castle. They play for him. His demeanor, the way he approaches the team, these guys will fight for him, and they believe in Matt Castle. But they also believe in Kyle Orton. I couldn't believe this was, I think this was his Iowa upbringing or whatever. Kyle came in here and acted like he had been here for five years, came in here very unassuming, very humble, very, worked his butt off and made plays to get the biggest upset in the National Football League this year when the Chiefs beat the Packers. There's a lot to like about Kyle Orton. And the question is, it becomes dollars, how, much dollar, how many dollars do you put at that position and who then is your competition? at the quarterback spot. Ideally, what's been proven in this league is you got your number one. The guy is kind of one B. The backup has got to be able to at least win one game. Because let's be honest, Matt's missed games now in all three years he's been the starter here. Uh, 
So that backup's got to be ready to go, and that's not atypical. Almost half the league or over half the league, this, the, number, the backup's got to come in and win. Matt Flynn and what he did in Green Bay a couple years ago. And then you've got your young guy because you continue to always look for the young guy. But to me, that's the way you look at your quarterback position going into camp. Is that Kyle Orton? I'm not sure. I will say this. There's a lot to like about Kyle Orton. But and there's a lot to like about Matt Castle. Because well, if like there's one thing I'm going to do is be defensive with our fans because I'm Twitter and be, is they think, you know, is Matt Castle some kind of bum now? I mean, he had 27 touchdowns two years right. ago. And the guy will take you the length of the field to win games. There's a lot to like about Matt Castle leading this team into the postseason and winning postseason games. There's a lot to like about free agency this year. I'll tell you what, I'm yeah. not a free agency guy. I, I, I think it's overblown. I think it's over -eyed, But I've never been this excited for Chiefs free agency because it's an interesting situation with Orton. You've got Bo and Carr, as we said, if we pop it back up, uh, Adam, our producer, and pop it back up. Two of the top ten free agents on the market are in-house. You want to make a big splash in free agency, you can do it by re-signing your guys. Right now, you've got the number two player in the entire league that's hit to be a free agent and the number nine player overall, according to CBS Sports, Pete Prisco, and, and similar rankings across the other pundits as well, but he's posted his list this week, so it's the most recent. And all those combined, and plus the other additions this team is going to make, and, and their ability to to make some moves this year, it just has me excited. And I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a huge free agency guy, but this year I'm just, I, I'm swallowing it all in. I think it's because right here, number two and number nine, it's interesting to watch. They're fun storylines. They're, they're, they're players that fans like. And, and there's a little bit of drama to it, too, is what's going to happen. Yeah. It, it's an exciting time, I think. Well, both of these guys, at least, and I've not talked to them, and, but what I've been able to kind of pick up the tea leaves are the team wants them back. Now, I'm not going to negotiate for the players of the team here, <laughs> but the players seem to want to be back. So I always talk about magnetic pull. The magnetic pull here is that... There's a two-way street of them remaining to be in that helmet, okay, with this team. And what this – the Chiefs have been criticized for not spending scabs of money out on Black Friday buying Christmas gifts <laughs> in free agency. But what they have done is decided to pay and pay up, pay up a lot of money to keep your core guys. Dwayne Bowe becomes interesting because he's as involved in your running game as he is your passing game. He has led the league in broken tackles twice as a wide receiver. He is a devastating blocker downfield. That's going to be more explosive in the ring game. He has to be more consistent. We all know that. Dwayne knows that. The drop against Oakland. Could have put, that's another key play that could have put the team in the playoffs. Okay. Um, he's got to be more consistent there. In the case of Carr, Carr has been a grinder, fighter. He continues to gain confidence. And you really got a little something going here with the secondary, which is like Kevin Ross and Cherry and those guys, Burris. You got that going on, and particularly with the guys you can add with the nickel dime situation. So it is exciting. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I feel the magnetic pull is that those guys could be Chiefs again, would be Chiefs again in 2012. And Black Friday shopping spree. You know, Randy <laughs> Moss wants to uh, wants to. Okay, uh, just I, put not, that I'm out. I'm just kidding. There. I'm not making just a good. Hey, we've had, I've had fans hit me. I could I got to at least mention this name. I don't think it makes sense in Kansas City, but hey, Black Friday shop. While we're at it, talking about Randy Moss. Now, Mace, before we sign off. That's when I'm going. You mortgage <laughs> the farm, take Joe Montana, get one AFC Championship game, and then you don't win a playoff game. Yeah, for the, another guy, 20 years. the guy, the guy's 35 and played on three teams in his last stop. But hey, you know, hey, it, it worked. It worked a few years ago for. New you England. can party like it's where, 1999. That's where, what I uh, Before we sign, where can we uh, hear you next on, um, on the basketball series? What's your next game you got? Actually, this week I don't have a midweek game, so it's uh, why I'm here. Man, it's uh, and, uh, relaxing. Allen Fieldhouse. Okay. Kansas against Texas Tech. I see your voice. The, your voice, the Texas Tech Red Raiders, and then you I go. Really, then you go to Ames after that. Are you? Going, <laughs> are you? Are you? No, I got you? Creighton. I got Creighton. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Creighton and Evansville the following Tuesday, and then I go to Ames <laughs> for, for Texas Iowa Tech. Iowa State. Iowa State, yes. Oh, boy. I He's can't get enough of Texas Tech. Fans. Your voice in the cheese is competition. From, you can uh, watch this on <laughs> CNN or MSNBC because Billy Clyde Gillespie <laughs> is already working on surrender terms with Bill Self <laughs> right now. It's only Tuesday, but he's asking for surrender terms. Voice of Billy Clyde, voice of Ames in <laughs> the cycle. And the mayor. Of course, voice of a lot of Chiefs fans in Ames. Too. Voice of the Cheese Mitchell. Thanks for coming by, man. Good to uh, get you back on the show. And 
Thanks for tuning in to Chiefs Live, brought to you by your Midwest Ford dealers. Next week, it's Combine Week. Mm -hmm. We'll be in Indianapolis. We'll uh, give you a preview show, show before we head out, though. Now we did free agency today. Let's talk college next week. We'll see you next week on Chiefs Live.